I would like to tell you about this project we're involved in who are, are trying to deal with the problem of malaria uh, using genetically modified mosquitoes. So just to remind us what the problem is here, so malaria continues to impose a huge burden on humanity with hundreds of millions of infections every year and hundreds of thousands of deaths every year. Mostly that's infants and children and mostly it's in Africa. There are current interventions, as you'll know, such as bed nets or indoor residual spraying, uh, and there are drugs, but those are not enough to eliminate the disease. And there has been some progress in bringing down those deaths, but in the last few years, anyway, that's plateaued. There's also the growing issue of drug resistance and insecticide resistance, so the existing tools we have at the moment uh, may stop working at some point in the future, and there'll be a reversal of the gains we've made over the last few years. Furthermore, these things cost more than there is money available. Uh, so the obvious prediction in is, is over the next few years that millions more are set to die from malaria. And that's just the reality it is. So this is some modeling that was done for, uh, as part of the WHO roadmap for malaria control. On the top panel you, there, you can see the burden of malaria in 2016, uh, obviously concentrated in Africa. and then. Predicting in 2030 what happens if we do a four, three or four-fold increase in the current interventions, and you can still and so it's going from something like 2.7 billion being spent a year to 9 billion. You can still see that after all that increase in the current interventions, you've still got a huge amount of malaria. Again, focused on Africa. So the general conclusion then is that we need new tools. That the current interventions are not good enough. There have been, um, quite apart from malaria, the field of malaria, there have been huge advances in genetic, uh, genetic approaches, genetic manipulations we can do, synthetic biology, genome, genome editing, et cetera. And in particular, there has been the development of potential gene drive approaches and the idea of that. And that is what we are trying to bring to bear to the problem of malaria. And the idea here is to, use, is to leverage normal biological processes like DNA replication, DNA repair, the reproduction of mosquitoes and the dispersal of mosquitoes to leverage those bi normal biological processes to make a highly uh, efficient intervention. It's kind of analogous to a vaccine which leverages the adaptive immune system inside every one of us to make a very highly efficient intervention. And that efficiency is really important in the context of rural Africa where you've got the large, large geography, not a lot of resources. So what is this gene drive? You're all familiar with Mendelian inheritance. That's, you've got two copies of every gene, one from your mother, one from your father. When you have children, you pass on one or the other with the 50-50 ratio. So the vast majority of genes are inherited in that way. There's a naturally occurring small minority of genes where that's not the case, that instead of being inherited, you get it from one of your parents, but instead of passing it on 50-50, it instead gets into 95% of the progeny, or 99% of the progeny. And then, uh, that process then of gene transmission from one generation to the next can lead to the spread of that gene, uh, the, the, the gene spreading through the population. So it can initially be rare, and then over successive generations, become more and more common within the population. So you can see, if, if, if under Mendelian inheritance, you start rare, you stay rare, but with, with gene drive, you start rare, you can, over successive generations, uh, become a larger and larger fraction of the population. There are, as I mentioned, it's a natural process which you're, we are learning to mimic. Uh, this ability of a gene to spread, even though it's not doing anything good for the organism carrying it, and indeed, even if it's causing some harm to the organism carrying it, that makes this an attractive process to try to harness, to spread genes, to engineer a population to be less harmful. Now there's two general approaches that people are thinking about for making, using this gene drive approach for malaria control or control of other pests. One is to use it to reduce the numbers of that mosquito population, or another is to change the mosquitoes in some way such that they're less harmful, such that they can't transmit the malaria. We are largely focused on the first of those, reducing the numbers of mosquitoes, but there's others working on the changing them so they're less able to transmit the disease, and in due course, there's no reason they can't necessarily be combined. 
So some modeling we've been, computer simulations we've been doing to look at this question of efficacy. So that, this is a thousand by th thousand by thousand kilometer bit of Africa centered on Burkina Faso in Western Africa. So there's 42,000 settlements in that uh, square. And what we modeled then was, so is, so every one of those green dots is a settlement. And uh, what we modeled then was releasing just 10 ideal, and when I say ideal, that means males that, male mosquitoes that are as fertile as a normal male uh, mosquito is in that population. And doing that just into 1% of those settlements, 420 of them, and do that for uh, three or four years. And then watch what happens, at least in the computer. So this graph shows the female, the numbers of females. It goes up and down. That's with the seasonal cycle of wet and dry season going up and down. And then we got the time times zero. They're in the release, and you can see that's it's a log scale. And you get we're getting about 95 suppression, 95 percent suppression of the population over uh, three or four years, with this relatively you know quite a small uh, release effort, intervention effort. So that gives you some sense of the potential leveraging or power or efficiency of this sort of approach that we're aiming for. So our procedure then is in developing this and see what works best in the computer along the lines of what I've shown you, then what we can make, see what we can make work in the lab, and then eventually we hope to, make, to, to see whether it will work in the field. In terms of our computer work, what works, we've got sort of got two strategies that we think can work. Uh, the dry, what we we'll call a driving Y chromosome or gene knockout by homing. I uh, don't have time to tell you about both. I'll just tell you about this gene knockout by homing approach that we are following up. And I should mention that all the molecular work is being done in the lab of Andrea Crisanti uh, at Imperial College in South Kensington. Okay, what is this homing reaction? The homing reaction is a process by which a gene on one chromosome get a, get a, gets self copied across to the opposite chromosome. Um, in the organism, so it converts, so instead of being on one of the two chromosomes, it's, it's on both of them, so instead of getting to 50% of the progeny, it gets to all the progeny. Over on the right, there's a little molecular diagram of how that works. It makes a, this gene makes an enzyme that goes back and recognizes chromosomes that don't contain a copy of the gene, and it cuts them, you know, so it this makes this gene makes an enzyme that, rec that has a recognition sequence. It specifically recognizes chromosomes not containing the gene, and it cuts them. And then during the repair process, the, the cell doesn't stick the two ends back together again. It'll use the other chromosome as a template for repair. So during that repair process, you, the gene gets copied across, and so therefore you get going from a heterozygote, one copy, to two, a homozygote, two copies. So this is a natural process by which many selfish genes can, are able to spread through microbial populations. And what we are trying to do is use it to knock out genes involved in female fertility of the mosquito. The idea then is to take one of these genes, these nuclease genes, put it in the middle of a, fem of a female fertility gene, a gene that the mosquito females need to be fertile, and that would have the effect of knocking out that female fertility gene, make it just non-functional. And then as that, the, our nuclease gene spreads through the population, you're spreading through the knockout of that uh, target gene. And to make sure you do that so that uh, if, you, if the female inherits it from one of their parents, then they're still fertile, and they're passing it on to 95% of their progeny. But if they get it from both their parents, then they're sterile. And so in that case, then, the gene will, when it's rare, spread through a population, increase in frequency, and then as it becomes more and more common in the population, then females start getting it from both their parents, and then those females are sterile. So you get a larger and larger fraction of the population uh, of the females that are sterile. And at least in the computer, that can lead to the crash of a population, and indeed, when you, you've been able to do it in the lab, and shown exactly that. So this is one of these nuclease so for those who might know it, this is a CRISPR-based construct uh, targeting a gene that's involved in the sex-determining pathway of the mosquito called double sex. And uh, what, what, what the graphs show is the one on the left shows that we're introducing the gene at a relatively low frequency, then over successive generations, it spreads through the population. The uh, gray lines are computer simulated based on what we expected. The red and the blue lines are what we observed in actual cages. 
and uh, you can see that it did indeed spread through the population up to up so 100% of the individuals then had it, and then as it does so, the egg output from the cages goes down till after either eight generations or 12 generations, the cage crashed. And we've now repeated this in uh, four or five more cages and gotten exactly the same results. So it is possible then, at the least at the lab scale, then to be able to introduce these genes into a population which, which spread over successive generations and get a crash of the population uh, without any sign of resistance evolving. <coughs> Okay, so there's more than just technical success for getting this product out to the field. Uh, not only do we have to answer the question, does it work? We also need to ask, is it going to be acceptable? And is that gonna be acceptable both to regulators and to the public at large? And then can it be delivered? Is there the capacity and the expertise to be able to do that? Just go through a few of those challenges that we are facing on these other fronts other than the technical front. So on the uh, regulatory front, you know, this is genetically modified organisms. It's a new technology, and the legislation that currently exists for GM organisms is largely designed around the crops. And obviously, a GM genetically modified mosquito, where we want the construct to persist and spread in the environment, is quite a different context than they have with, uh, with GM crops. In terms of engagement challenges, we want to, at the extent possible, bring and maintain the discussion closest to those who are most likely to be affected by this technology one way or another. We need to find the right balance between act, um, engaging proactively with people but not over-promising while we're still developing the technology. Must, everybody should understand that this, we don't see this as a silver bullet. And to actually eliminate or eradicate um, malaria, it's gonna take all the tools in the toolbox. And we want to, of course, ensure that the decisions can be at all levels, can be as informed as possible despite the novelty of the technology. And then the capacity challenges, of course, nobody's done this before and we're all learning it together. So to deal with these other challenges, we've got sort of a phased approach that we're trying to go through. That is to say, we don't want, while at the very end, we have this vision of a gene drive construct that would spread through the population, sterilize the females, reduce the population, reduce malaria transmission. That's, we don't think should be the first uh, modified mosquito to be uh, introduced and released. We should be starting with making baby steps. And so we have, first, ha we have uh, first of all, a sterile male line. So genetically sterile males, no spread, no gene drive. And we want to gain, use that strain as a tool to gain information, knowledge, and acceptance uh, for us and for, every, for, the whole, for the whole project so that we can approach this in an incremental way rather than jumping in at the deep end. And indeed, we have uh, another strain that we want, the so-called male bias strain, that, where the males will be fertile, but the construct will disappear gradually over gen successive generations rather than spread. And then eventually, we get to our self-sustaining gene drive one. So we have collaborators in uh, four African countries, Burkina Faso, Mali, Uganda, and Ghana, uh, which are various stages of implementing this. There's a lot of local... Uh, Engage, intensive local engagement in the villages where we're working, trying to explain what we're doing. Uh, it involves open days in the insectaries to explain what, what we're doing. Country-specific brochures. There's a theater form, form, a form that has been developed to explain our, uh, our approach. Building uh, insectaries in these countries to the same containment standards as they, they would be in this country or in the US. That's an important part of it. And obviously the training that goes along with that. Uh, et cetera, and so forth. So just to summarize then, want to emphasize for you that new tools really are needed for malaria control and elimination. We think genetic approaches to controlling mosquito populations have a, the potential to be hugely effective in helping us in that goal. Success in a venture like this has technical uh, issues, but there's also regulatory and acceptance and capacity building issues that are also uh, important components of the Whole package, and we think a step-by-step -step or phased approach uh, to the development is going to allow for checking of assumptions at each step along the way. <laughs>